Thank you for keeping each other company today as we sing and pray and study God's Word together on this, the Lord's Day, a significant day in the church calendar, Pentecost Sunday, which from a preaching perspective is interesting because there's so many options of things to talk about that are significant on Pentecost Sunday. We could talk about the events on that particular day from Acts chapter 2 that you heard a little bit about this morning. We could talk about the Holy Spirit in general and what the coming of the Holy Spirit means for us today. We could talk about the church because in many ways, I like to think of Pentecost as the birthday of the church. It's with the Holy Spirit's coming, the apostles were transformed and animated and the mission of God really was propelled from that day onwards. So, so many things to talk about. What I want to do this morning is to look at events just close to the events of Pentecost Sunday. So not Acts chapter two exactly, but Acts chapter three, uh, a particular story uh, of um, a miracle that took place in the church, the first miracle in the history of the church. And then Peter's reflection on this, the Apostle Peter's sermon. So the second sermon in the history of the church from Acts chapter three. So go ahead in your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Acts and to chapter three. And as you're busy turning there, you know, Acts is amazing because it narrates for us, there's a lot of narrative material about what was happening in the early church. So most of it's just that kind of narrative material, but a large part of it, about a third of the book of Acts is actually made up of sermons or speeches which are are really not just great because I love sermons, uh, but because they are windows into understanding the significance of the events. So there's a lot of events, but the speeches and the sermons tell us what was happening in those events, uh, the significance of them. And so the sermon that we're gonna look at this morning, Peter's second sermon, I think you'll see that it summarizes his first sermon and adds a bit of additional material. So interpreting the events around Pentecost and even the events around the death and resurrection of Jesus, which would have been just a couple months before that. Sound good? Are we ready? So Bible's out, pens at the ready. Let's go, reading from Acts chapter three. We're gonna read the whole chapter this morning. So here we go. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they laid daily at the gates of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple, so asking for money. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. How many of you have a Sunday school song in your head at the moment, right? Classic Sunday school upbringing. I got that song in my head. I will not sing it for you. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So just pause there for a second. So this is a a narration of a particular event, this first miracle that takes place in the church. It's clearly the result of the Holy Spirit now at work through the apostles, and it draws a crowd. So like Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit comes, there's kind of miraculous things going on, a crowd gathers, Peter preaches. Similar kind of scenario, this miracle, crowd gathers, And now Peter addresses the crowd in this, his second sermon, so from verse 11. So while this man clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, an area, a covered area of the temple, outside the temple. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And a faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So there you go, there's an event, and then there's a sermon, and Peter's interpreting the significance of the sermon. But he carries on now in the sermon, because what he wants to do is not just interpret the significance for them, he wants to invite them in, that they have opportunity to experience the significance of these events. So carrying on, verse 17. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, so you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people." And all the prophets who've spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Now, what caught my attention about Peter's second sermon here was, well, it was a little interaction I had with a, with a friend a, a while ago, a few weeks ago, and he just, he quoted one line in Peter's sermon, just like off the cuff and moved on, and this one line really stuck with me, and I want to draw your attention to that one line today, a very appealing line in that sermon. That phrase Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Just how good does that sound? How appealing does that sound, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord? Now I get like right now, it's like really cold, so that loses its effect a little bit. I mean, it literally means that refreshing is like to be cooled off. If we were preaching this in the Northern Hemisphere on Pentecost, it would immediately be a lot more appealing. But doesn't it just sound great? Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It, it speaks to this idea of being tired. Anybody tired? Like worn out, burning out, at, at the end of your tether, just drained, fatigued. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. How about even the idea of maybe not worn out per se, but maybe just bored, like stagnant, stale, maybe in your Christian experience or life, like it's just become a big rut. Maybe your Christianity feels like that, like just going through the motions. And maybe you came to church this morning and thinking Pentecost, maybe this day I'll be refreshed. Well, good, hopefully you will be today because that's exactly what's been spoken about here, this idea of times of refreshing coming to us from the presence of the Lord. You want to find out what that means? Good, all three of you. <laughs> For the rest of you, by the end you will. So we're going to unpack that a little bit this morning, but to be honest, there's a lot that we've got to 
understand about Peter's sermon before we can fully appreciate what times of refreshing means. So as is with Peter's early sermons, they function as like a summary of everything about Christianity. And so Pentecost Sunday, I think is a good time as well to look at the sermon and just refresh our understanding of everything about Jesus. So in his sermon, he basically unpacks it all. So that's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to just run through the early parts and I'm going to try, I'm going to burn through them. So just like be ready so we can get to understanding what times of refreshing means. But then this, we're going to unpack just the essence of Christianity basically in five questions. I think Peter's answering five questions. Even if people aren't asking these questions, he's answering them. And so here we go. Here's number one. Without further ado, number one question, who is Jesus? Now I get it. Most of us this morning, I mean, you know who Jesus is, but I think in the sermon, there are phrases used to describe Jesus that are probably unfamiliar to you. And certainly for Peter's listeners, his Jewish audience, they would never have used these phrases to talk about the man who was killed just a few months earlier. So here's how Peter teaches them about the person Jesus. So number one, he talks about Jesus as God's glorified servant. He uses that phrase twice, actually, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. Now, when I say God's glorified servant, I'm not using it like today some people would use when they speak of like a pilot. They might say a pilot's just a glorified bus driver. I didn't say that. I think pilots are terrifically cool. But some pilots have said that about themselves. I don't mean that phrase like that, like glorified, like servant, you know, but with a kind of a new kind of appeal. Actually, Peter's referring to very deliberately the prophet Isaiah, who way before prophesied about the Messiah and used very deliberately this language of a servant, God's servant. So if you've been around Christianity for a while, especially through Easter, in Isaiah, a lot of Isaiah is just so mysterious and wonderful and complex, but Isaiah 52 to 53, for Christians, we're like, I get it. This is about Jesus. It's so clearly about Jesus. So there's a wonderful passage, a man of sorrows acquainted with griefs and he bore our transgressions. That little part of Isaiah we call the servant song because it's about the servant, the Messiah who would come like a servant. And that servant song is bookended by this phrase, my servant. So let me just read it to you. Isaiah 52, verse 13 and 53, verse 12, skipping out a lot in the middle. But listen to the servant phrase. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He'll be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. And then it'll go on to is despised and rejected by men. But then it carries on. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted righteous. And he, my servant, will bear their iniquities. And we're like, that's Jesus. That's obviously Jesus. Yes, this is what Peter's saying. His Jewish listeners would have been very familiar with my servant. So Isaiah starts and ends his servant song with my servant. Peter starts and ends his, ser- his sermon with my servant. And he mentions it again in verse 26. He's very deliberately saying, this guy, the servant, is the Messiah, Jesus. But that's not all. He also talks about Jesus as the holy and righteous one which sounds like just a fancy Christian way of saying like a really cool guy. You denied, you rejected what turned out to be a pretty fantastic guy. But actually, again, the phrase here is very deliberate imagery that the prophets used to talk about the Messiah. Again, maybe you picked up on it and Isaiah 52 was there, the holy and righteous one. This is how Jesus is described. Later in Acts Stephen, who's one of the first deacons in the church, is about to be martyred. And he gives a sermon and recaps everything. Beautiful sermon. And he'll use the same way, the same phrase to talk about Jesus. Listen how similar it sounds to Peter's sermon. This is Stephen now. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Right, these early disciples were not afraid of really like pointing out, you betrayed and you murdered the righteous one. 
And in fact, in Peter's sermon, he, he puts the, the righteous one, Jesus, says, you asked for the murderer to be released and instead you killed the righteous one. So the holy and righteous one is how he talks about Jesus, but that's not all. He also talks about Jesus as, this might be new to you, the author of life. Jesus, the author of life. Which is a really interesting phrase. It does speak to Jesus being present at creation, the eternal God, the Son of God. But it also, what it really means in this context, actually the ideas of the leader, the leader of life, meaning the one who paved the way so others could follow, so the one who paved the way from death to life. And the Apostle Paul will use that imagery of Jesus in his resurrection was the first fruits, the one who went so that we could follow him to life. The author of life. And again, Peter uses that phrase, he's the author of life and you killed him. He's very deliberately confronting them with their participation in the events that had just taken place. So the author of life, but that's not all. Lastly, he refers to Jesus as his Christ, not Peter's Christ, God's Christ. In verse 17 to 18, I, you, I know you acted in ignorance as did your rulers, but what God foretold that his Christ. I know most of you know this, but just to be sure, for many people, Jesus Christ, the word Christ just kind of sounds like a surname, but it's actually a title. It's the kind of English way of saying the Greek word translating the Hebrew word Messiah. The Messiah, God's Messiah. Like he's been very deliberate. This is the person, these events two months ago, this man that you saw did these miracles, this is who he is, the servant, the Messiah, the author of life, the holy and righteous one, and you killed him, he says. Which brings us to the second question that Peter's answering. So that's who Jesus is. He's unpacking the man Jesus for them, amen? Good refresher for us this morning, who Jesus is. Now he unpacks what happened to him. He was delivered over, denied and killed. You killed this author of life. But that's not all, is it? What happened to Jesus? God's just, I mean, what happened? He was killed. And then God raised him to life. It's not the end of the story that he was killed, but God raised him up from the dead. So this is Peter talking about the significance of the events that took place over the past few months. But he's not just, the purpose of the sermon is not just interpreting the past for them. What he's also obviously trying to do is interpret the significance of the current events for them, which was the occasion of this amazing healing of this lame man, which leads to the third question. So that's who Jesus is, that's what happened to him. The third question, maybe in the back of their minds is, well, what is Jesus doing now? God raised him up. Okay, what's he up to then? Answer, a whole lot, right? A whole lot Jesus is busy doing. At the very least, I mean, we know a lot. But at the very least from this passage, what is Jesus doing now? What is Peter saying? He's healing people. He's healing them. He's bringing restoration. And it's not just this temporary relief this merciful act, you know, shame poor guy and I'll help him out. It is that. But here's a man who had the odds stacked against him from birth. He had no chance. He was born like this. We're told that. He had no chance of earning an income. His whole life was just set out that he would be the guy sitting at the gates of a temple begging for the rest of his life. No chance of dignity, no chance of a normal life. That was his lot because he was born into a broken womb in a broken world. But Jesus reverses that curse around his life and fully restores him. That's what Jesus is doing now. And Peter's clear about that. It's not our power, which is a, ref you know, he's thinking when Jesus told him, Acts 1 verse 8, but wait, you will be clothed with power from on high and you will be my witnesses. So he's going, it's not our power, it's this power from on high, which is ultimately Jesus, his name. When he says it's by the name of Jesus, he was saved. He's not giving us a little incantation, a spell that you can use anytime, you know, where something like your car doesn't start. In the name of Jesus, 
Like, you know, I don't know, maybe sometimes that works, but that's what he's talking about by using the name of Jesus. It's referring to the person of Jesus, the risen Jesus, who's now ascended in heaven. He's discharging and animating a healing, a restoring power. He's doing this, Peter says. That's what he's up to, partly, but there's more that Peter refers to here. He talks about that phrase, my phrase, that we'll get to, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's part of what Jesus is doing now. Fourth question then is, what must we do? So as I pointed out in Acts 2, there's the miracles, there's the crowd, Peter preaches, they go, man, what must we do? This time they're not asking what must we do, but Peter's telling them anyway what they must do. And it's a one word answer really. And if you've been around Rosebank for a few months, if you're thinking what is the appropriate response to a message about Jesus, one word should always be popping into your head. It's the word repent, repent. That's what he says, repent therefore and turn back. So repent if you've, if you, if you've forgotten. It's the, at its most basic sense does mean to turn. I was going this way and now I'm turning around. And in case you miss it here, Peter repeats it for emphasis, repent and turn back. In other words, it's this idea of if this man Jesus, this historical person, is the author of life, the servant, the Messiah, the holy and righteous one, if he really is that, and if now in his resurrected sense he's discharging this animating power, like, If you want access to that, stop going this way, your previous religion, your previous way of life and turn and go this way. That's what repent means. In fact, at the end of his sermon in verse 26 again, Peter will use that same phrase. He'll say, God having raised up his servant, in the second reference to the servant, says, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. That's the whole idea of repentance. This way was leading to wickedness. And now I'm going this way to the author of life, to the righteous one in whose presence is this discharging of animating, restoring power. So repent, it's quite simple, isn't it? Is it simple? It is simple. It's not complicated, but it is very hard. Because why would you do this? I mean, this is what the the, the people listening to Peter are wrestling with. Like to go the way of Jesus, to go against the way of their forefathers, like for anybody today who makes that decision to turn and follow Jesus, like guys tonight who have been baptized, like you're setting yourself up to go in the direction of somebody who very clearly for us Christians today, whose name, the name of Jesus is not called out to bring restorative animating power. The name of Jesus is mentioned as a mockery, as a curse. So you're setting yourself in that direction. You're setting yourself to follow the person who's defined by the phrase servant. And we know as Christians in the small print, it's actually not small print, it's all over. We will enter that same lifestyle of servanthood. So you're setting yourself in direction. Why would you do that? Well, that's the last question. And Peter's answering. This is why you'd want to do that. Number one, that your sins may be blotted out that your sins may be blotted out. Repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. I think, again, Peter's audience, his Jewish listeners, their minds surely would have gone back to Psalm 51. Maybe some of your minds went there as well. This is David's psalm of confession and repentance after his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, his murder of her husband. Remember that? And Nathan confronts him about it and then he repents in the Psalm 51. And this is what he says. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Listen, here's the bottom line of this. I need to move on here. When God forgives, 
he wipes the slate clean. When God forgives, he erases all of the data. You know, these days, it's hard to erase data. Search histories and everything you've done, like so much of it is like it's there. But he erases. When God forgives, he wipes the slate clean completely. This is what happens when you repent, when we turn from the wickedness and in the name of Jesus receive forgiveness and cleansing. That's the first benefit, why you would want to repent so that your sins may be blotted out. The second one, so that you will be ready for his restoration. Now, if you're following on the screen here, if you're like a person to take notes, you'll know I've jumped from A to C. That's deliberate here. And you'll see why in a moment. But you'll be ready for the time of restoration. Let me try to summarize this quickly because I do want to get to time of refreshing. What Peter's talking about very clearly is a future time. This time that's, Rosebank, guys, still future for us. This time of restoring all things, that's going to happen still. We know it's still going to happen because he says heaven must receive Jesus until the time for restoring all things. So from the ascension is heaven receiving Jesus. And unless I missed it, he hasn't come back yet, has he? Is it just me? Is it just us? We missed out? No. So it's still coming. A time for restoring all things. This is another just phrase we could dwell on because stuff is broken. Yes, stuff is broken. We are, the world is. Where is it heading? Well, greater destruction still to come. But then a time of restoring all things where everything is corrected. There'll be no more tears, no more dysfunction, no more brokenness at all. Beautiful. That time is still coming. And basically, Peter's saying repentance means for those who repent and are with Jesus, when that time of restoring all things, so when he comes again, we have access to that. But on that day, those who are not with Jesus summarizing a lot here and quoting Moses, they will be cut off from all the people. Right? And so Peter, Moses was this a prophet as well. And God says, listen to Moses. If you don't listen to Moses, you'll be, you'll be cut off. You won't have entrance into what I'm doing in the people of God. And Moses says, yes, and there's coming one like me who you should listen to else you'll be cut off from the kingdom of God. And Peter goes, that other person that Moses referred to is Jesus. So listen to him. Basically, the offer, restoring or destruction, is your choice, is what he's telling those people and telling us today. That's another good reason to be repenting, to be in the trajectory of all things being restored. But that's not all. That leads us finally to the last one. How's that for an introduction? In the past, our sins blotted out. In the future, a beautiful future awaiting for us. But what about today? What about now? Aha. Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In a nutshell, here's what that means. See, the future restoring, it's still coming in its final full form. But we still have access to part of that today. How do I know that? Because this is the story of a guy who was lame and paralyzed from birth, but because of the animating power of Jesus being discharged by the Holy Spirit now, he he was restored now. I mean, he would still die, this lame man, ultimately. He would still have many troubles in life, I am sure. But there was a restorative act in his life. It's not just for the future, guys. Isn't this good news? All of that restoring, all of that healing is not just for one day. You have access to at least part of it today. That's what times of refreshing is referring to. The work of the Holy Spirit bringing to us almost from the future into our present state at least parts 
of restoration and healing and peace and so many other things. Maybe there's like one or two people out there wondering, are you sure that this time of refreshing is referring to Pentecost and the spirits? And I don't have time to get into it, but homework. Look at Peter's speech in Acts chapter two and see the pattern. He says, repent, your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Then look at Peter's sermon in Acts chapter three and he says, repent, your sins will be blotted out. Times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Seems to me those two are equated, yes? I just did your homework for you. Aren't you happy? I was just gonna let you do it, but there it is. So today we say on Pentecost Sunday, we, we remember this, that there's this promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit that's available to all. And part of what Peter is addressing is this time of refreshing, but don't miss the sequence. If there's one thing you've got to get right today is the sequence here. There's a very deliberate pattern. And it's in Peter's speech in Acts 2. It's in Peter's speech in Acts 3. It's in the moment where the Spirit comes across the Samaritans in Acts 8. It's in the moment where the Spirit comes across the Gentiles. That's us in Acts 10. The same pattern. Believe me. Home, go check it out. But here's the pattern. Repent. Turn. By the name of Jesus, your sins will be forgiven and you're washed clean. And when you're clean then the Holy Spirit can take residence in your life. You become a clean vessel. He takes residence. And when that happens, you're opening yourself to times of refreshing and restoration. If you come here this morning, and A, you're just seeking more of the Spirit in your life and a greater experience of the fullness of the Spirit, it will not happen without this posture of repentance and cleansing that comes from the name of Jesus who then sends his spirit and the animating, restoring, healing power in times of refreshing. Got it? Okay, so now let's end. A few more minutes. To just put a picture in your minds of what times of refreshing means. What does this mean? It so caught my attention. Oh, that sounds great. What does it mean? I think it means what you think it means. Honestly, I've got two more minutes so I can use them. But if we had no more time, I would be happy just sending you out going, time's refreshing, man. What does that mean to you? That's probably what it means. But to just help get a picture of this, there's this phrase, this phrase comes up in the Old Testament a lot. Very curious in the New Testament. It comes up in the Old Testament. So let me just, I'm just gonna narrate to you stories from the Old Testament with this phrase in it. And I'll run through them. In the Ten Commandments given to God's people about the Sabbath day of rest. Six days you'll work, but on that seventh day, rest you and your slaves and your servants so that you may be refreshed. So time of refreshing includes this idea of rest from labor. Samson, remember Samson? Kills a thousand Philistines on his own with his bare hands. Okay, not bare hands, armed with the jawbone of a donkey. You know that story? Turns out that is very thirsty work. Who knew? So he's thirsty, cries out to God, you let me die, yeah, I'm so thirsty. And we read Judges 15, God split open the rock for him, water came out, and when he drank it, his spirit returned and he revived. That speaks to serving and God and Christianity and then this reviving. Saul, King Saul, so many issues, one of them, plagued by demons, haunted by them, who tormented him. And David, not yet king, is a skillful musician, plays for him. And you read, whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well. Speaks to those tormented and feeling and oppression and being refreshed and made well. And you don't need David, the musician, or David Marburg, the musician, playing for you to release you from that torment. It's this times of refreshing. It's available now. Last story, speaking of David, hunted, 
pursued, cursed. Literally, it's a story of this guy just cursing him from the street, just all day long cursing him. And he's running away with his men and he gets to this place exhausted. And we read the king and all the people who were with him arrived exhausted at their destination where David refreshed himself. It's all those things. You, you thought of that, right? That, that's in your head. Yes, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It's available to everyone today. You need to repent and be cleansed. And being cleansed isn't a matter of sacrifice anymore because Jesus has been sacrificed and is alive. So if you're with me today and kind of needing some refreshing, man, it's not complicated. But it does require this moment of repentance. So let's do that, yes? Let's pray together. Let's keep each other company as we confess and repent and hopefully by faith in the name of Jesus receive a time of refreshing. So Lord Jesus, we come before you as those who've been gathered into this place, called into the community of faith by you, Holy Spirit, who first awoke us opened our eyes to see who you were. Maybe not fully, Lord Jesus. I pray this morning, even so for those who haven't had this clear picture of who you are, open eyes and hearts to see you as the Messiah, the Savior, the Servant. We gather, we're gathered here, Lord Jesus, in your name, Believing in you, not just the historical person, but the one tortured, killed, resurrected, now exalted, right now ruling in power and discharging to us the animating power of your spirit. We're gathered in your name and we pray together for times of refreshing. And so we confess to you that so much of our struggle in this world, so much of our exhaustion and fatigue and oppression is actually the result of our own sinful actions, of our not fully following you. And so we confess, and as already we've prayed together this morning, would you grant to us an undivided heart, hearts around this room to be to a greater degree fixed on you, Jesus, and your kingdom and your words. We embrace you, we receive you. We no longer deny or reject you, but exalt you and pray, Lord Jesus, in your risen state in the heavens above, discharge to us a time of refreshing. which we receive by faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said, Amen.